know, Mr. Smith and I have had the privilege of um, giving the Living Youth podcast. And in it, we've solicited uh, topics from, from listeners out there and asked kids to send in topics they have. And so we've gotten a lot of topics, but one of them actually came from a dad. And he's a friend of mine and Mr. Smith's. And he sent me the following topic and thought maybe it would be a good one for the podcast. Now, after analyzing it, I, I did think that it could work for the podcast, but I thought it also sounded like maybe an ideal topic, an ideal length for a split sermon. My friend wrote the following. He said, how do we make sense of the angry psalms? And he put the angry psalms in quotes. I've been reading them with my kids, and I'm not sure my answers have been the best about some of these verses that make them perk up. And there are some real doozies out there. So I, I like how he phrased that. And for this sermon, I would like to make the title, The Angry Psalms. The Angry Psalms. And there are three psalms that I would like to break down today and bring a little more context to and a little more explanation of. And hopefully by the end, we'll have a greater understanding about why some of these psalms are worded the way they are. The three psalms, and that's assuming I don't run out of time for the last one, the three psalms are Psalm 58, 6. Psalm 58, 6. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. The second one is Psalm 137, 9. Happy, happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. And the final one is Psalm 139, 21 and 22. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And so as I said today, I would like to take each of these three and break them down. It was tempting to leave out the one about dashing the little children and leave that to somebody else. But hopefully we have some answers and a little context that will help. But I would like to start off with Psalm 58.6. And I only have three points and they're, they're, they're by these psalms. So the first point is angry Psalm 58. Angry Psalm 58. And let's turn over to the Psalms. Psalm 58, 6, which you ought to read. I'll go ahead and read it again. And then we'll expand the context right there in the Psalm with, and bring in a little of the rest of the Psalm. So again, as my friend posited it to me, and I've... Uh, my, my previous pastor we had when we lived back in Texas also cited this one as a difficult one that could be hard to explain to especially younger listeners, but, but to anybody really for that matter. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. This is a psalm of David. And ironically, if, you, if we read Psalm 58, the introduction, it says a psalm of David set to do not destroy. So it seems like an ironic statement. But as I said, the first thing I like to do when I'm tackling any kind of difficult scripture is immediately expand the context around it. Uh, I can set up my Bible study software so I can have it break it up into basically paragraphs. So I'll start with the paragraph and see what the larger picture is. So let's actually pick it up in Psalm 58.3 and read up through verse 8. It says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops its ear, which will not heed the voice of the charmers, charming ever so skillfully. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Another translation has, instead of fangs, the jawbones. And I think that actually will factor in a little bit later. Let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman, that they may not see the sun. You know, also, I, I, when, when I read this the first time, one of the first clues I picked up that it may not be as simple as David just wishing his enemies to violently have their teeth punched out was this one here in verse 7. And this is a controversial amongst the translators, because so there's another translation that translates it quite differently. But in general, the sense of it is the same. Another translation here, when it says, when he bends his bow, let his arrows be cut in pieces, says, make their weapons useless in their hands. And I think that's trending towards where we're, what we'll come to understand with this scripture. You know, I think one of the things 
you need to consider, one needs to consider when they start trying to understand a psalm, especially some, there's, there's definitely some difficult ones in there. There's seven in, in particular that are called the psalms of imprecation or the imprecatory psalms. Imprecation means a spoken curse. And this is one that falls in that category. But I think it's important to remember that in two of these three psalms that we're going to read that the author is David. He's not just somebody. He's a man we know very well because so much of his history was recorded in Psalms and Kings. So we know a lot about him. And I can tell, having studied David, that though he was a violent man and he was capable of taking care of business, he was not petty or vindictive or vicious. So my initial sense when tackling this topic was, that doesn't sound like something David is after, the, the enemies of him, his enemies having their teeth broken out, the way we think of very literally. And so I think what we'll find as we go through Psalm 58 and read some other scriptures that support it is that David is using the metaphor of a powerful, ravenous, predatory animal, in this case a lion, to symbolize his enemy's desire to consume him entirely. The trait of the lion, or we'll see about wolves later, or the tooth and the claw. That's what they tear and rip and devour with. I did just a a little bit of research on lions and, you know, their, their jaws and their teeth are where the focus of their, their power is. It's where they can bite down so that they can chomp and tear and rip their prey. Without that, they wouldn't be able to take any prey down. They wouldn't be able to feed themselves. It's a, it's a critical part of them. So the Bible frequently uses very common literary devices that we think of when we take a, a standard English class and read some great literary work. And the Bible's no if in, in difference. It's no different. Let's turn over to Ezekiel 30 and look at a great example of the Bible using numerous literary devices. We will come back to the Psalms in a little while, but let's go to Ezekiel 30 and pick it up in verse 21. I think one question you have to ask yourself, because some people go much too far and they turn uh, Revelation into a profound allegory and, and, and it has no literalism to it. That's, of course, a mistake. But with a difficult psalm like this, one of the things I I try to keep in mind is, is there some kind of motif going on here? Is there some kind of symbolism going on here? Is this representing something else? In Ezekiel 30, we'll pick it up in verse 21, and we'll read through verse 25, and we'll see a great example of this here. In fact, the subhead is, in the New King James Version, Egypt and her allies will fall at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Verse 21, son of man... I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and see, it has not been bandaged for healing, nor a splint put on it to bind it, to make it strong enough to hold a sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I am against the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and I will break his arm, both the strong one and the one that was broken, and I will make the sword fall out of his hand. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. But I will break Pharaoh's arm, and he will groan before, and he will groan before him with the groanings of a mortally wounded man. Thus I will strengthen the arm of the king of Babylon. But the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. They shall know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against them. The land of Egypt. So what we have here in this, what was it, four or five verses, this passage includes metaphors, imagery, personification. Since we talked about it in our podcast lately, or recently, we mentioned the synecdoche. There's a hint of that in there as well. And a juxtaposition as he puts what he's going to do with Pharaoh and his demise versus how he's going to deal with Nebuchadnezzar, or sorry, with Babylon. So I think when you read through here, I, don't, I think I would imagine that in general, we don't read that and assume that that's really literal. Now maybe, because some of you may say how often God fulfills things on every level, maybe, maybe Pharaoh fell down the stairs and actually cracked his arm. But really what we have in play here is God is going to prevent or break Pharaoh's strength. He's going to prevent him from being able to make war as symbolized by the sword. And by contrast, he's going to give Babylon the strength and the military fighting ability that he needs to conquer Egypt. In fact, the expositor's Bible commentary says, God declared that he had shattered Pharaoh Hophra's arm. The flexed arm was a common Egyptian symbol for the Pharaoh's strength. Often statues or images of the Pharaohs have this flex, has the arm flexed wielding a sword in battle. A king with great biceps was especially a popular concept 
under the Saites, which I guess was the dynasty at the time. In addition, Hophra took a second formal title that meant possessed of a muscular arm or strong arm. Therefore, Hophra's defeat was most suitably represented by breaking his arm. So I think you get the idea here with that example. Let's go over just a few chapters to another one. Ezekiel 22 and verse 25. And what we're going to see here is some corrupt leaders in several different categories ruling over Israel, but they have become corrupted, and God depicts them as roaring lions and wolves seeking to devour their prey. Ezekiel 22, and we'll read verses 25 through 27. Ezekiel 22, picking it up in verse 25. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known their differences between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Her princess, that's symbolic of the, of the commercial leaders, and the, uh, not the, but not the religious leaders. Her princess in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. So not only is that using more symbolism here, but we're showing more clearly how the Bible uses this idea. There is a whole motif that's not limited to the Psalms running. Uh, I didn't look to see that it was the entire Bible, but running through there of large predatory animals being used in this devouring capacity and a simile with people and what they're doing. So let's go back to Psalms, and let's pick up a number of Psalms. Most of these, I believe, were written by David. And let's start in Psalm 10. This one also could easily be viewed or misinterpreted as, as being vindictive and savage. Uh, we'll pick it up in Psalm 10, verse 9. It's interesting in the, in the commentaries, one of the commentaries said you could summarize this whole Psalm 10 as why? Why? Um, we're going to break in the middle here. The psalmist describes the wicked at work. Verse 9, he lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that he may, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account, speaking of the wicked. But you have seen, you, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. You know, back there in the, at the beginning of the psalm, it's depicting a, a lion, which is, often crouches down, and is, it's not entirely an ambush um, predator, but that is, there is an element of it. Lying in wait to crouch and pounce on the helpless. And verse 10 brings out that he has, there is a strength to him, and he can overpower those who can't help themselves. And so I would, I would argue that the psalmist here, like the metaphor in Ezekiel, is once again using this arm as symbolic of the strength of the evildoer to perpetuate evil and to pounce on the helpless. Let's come down to another one, Psalm 17. This one is a prayer of David. And we'll pick it up in verse 8. We'll read Psalm 17, verse 8 through 12. And the part that we're skipping over, uh, David opens by pleading his innocence. He describes a scene of being encircled by his enemies. In Psalm 17, verse 8, he says, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed up their fat hearts. With their mouths they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey, and like a young lion lurking in secret places, which is exact, exactly, is very similar to the language, the, um, the language used in Psalm 58. 
So the wicked here, again, depicted as a predatory animal eager to tear its prey. Uh, let's come down to Psalm 35. So it's another Psalm of David. And again, depicting his adversaries as a roaring lion, seeking his demise. And he's asking, he's pleading for divine intervention. And he makes the case that his enemies hurt him and come after him without a cause. In fact, it talks about him fasting for, his en- for his, now his enemies at the time. And it's funny because the tone of this, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, is it's like David's not even mad, he's just kind of hurt. So verse 12 Yeah, Psalm 35, verse 12 through 17. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. So just again, it's getting repetitive at this point. But hopefully what we see is a very clear uh, motif emerging of the wicked and the ungodly portrayed as prey animals, or sorry, uh, predatory animals with seeking to devour their enemies. And David was often in their sights. Uh, Let's come down to Psalm 57. We'll actually read uh, the the introduction here in Psalm 57, and then we'll skip down to Psalm 57, 4. It's once again to the chief musician set to do not destroy, a victim of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. Psalm 57, 4, my soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spear and arrows and their tongues a sharp sword. So bringing this idea even more into into focus. It's kind of interesting there. I was curious about that. Uh, Men who are set on fire. There's a couple of different ways you could translate that. Another translation has, I lie down among those who want to devour me. Another one, the NASB says, those who breathe forth fire. So my soul is among lions. I lie among those who breathe forth fire. It's just continued imagery of enemies set on consuming and destroying. Also, that's interesting because this is Psalm 57. This is just one chapter away from our introductory one. We're here once again. David is talking about his, the, the teeth of his enemies and, the, and likens them to spears and arrows and sharp sword. Okay, Psalm 124. We'll pick it up in verse 2, Psalm 124, and we'll read verses 2 through 6. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The streams would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey into their teeth. As one commentary brings out, I mean, at at this point, I think it's pretty straightforward, but in the jaws, we feel the slow agonies of defeat, like the tearing and grinding of the prey. You know, this is what David wanted to put a stop to. His enemies pictured as predatory animals. And as I said at the beginning, the trade of lion, wolves, and bears, the tooth and the claw. And we've seen either further that's extrapolated out as swords and spears and other things. And what's the purpose of them? To hurt, to tear, and to consume. And David is asking for God to put that, to take away that power from his enemies so that they cannot devour him and consume him. Let's actually go back to Psalm 3. This also, I would assume, is, is, is considered a, a more difficult scripture as well, but with the context here, this will be very easy. Psalm 3 and verses 6 through 7. There's a lot of psalms. 
Psalm 3, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone and you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. I, see, I think that adds a nice context to what David, that's essentially what David is asking for, for, for God to rise up and render his adversaries powerless. Let's look at one, well, actually two, if there's two. Let's look at one more scripture here as we finalize this point, and that is in Job 29. Job 29, and we'll read 14 through 17. Here, Job, there's actually a couple places where Job does this. We're just going to read one of them, where he depicts the wicked as predatory animals. Verse 14 of Job 29. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked, but why? And plucked the victim from his teeth. So once again here, Job, uh, using put, tying all these um, symbols together, frankly, and, and making it much clearer to us here as the reader, and we have one final scripture, and that is over in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Because who is the ultimate ravenous lion out there who would consume all of us? First Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Naturally, it's no accident that Satan is depicted in this way, because that is exactly what he would like to do to humanity, consume, tear, bite, destroy, and as slowly and miserably as possible. You know, in Psalm 58, 6, David asked God to break out the teeth of his enemies. But he's not a petty, vindictive man. He's not looking for them to, yeah, you know, suffer in pain. Um, actually, I don't want to delve too far into maybe what David was thinking on this. But the, 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 the larger picture here is to be safe from his adversaries. You know, Psalm 58 is using the metaphor of a powerful, ravenous, predatory animal. And in this case, a lion. But in other cases, we saw that it was wolves and other things. David is asking for God to intervene so that he can prevent his enemies from doing harm to him and his family. The second psalm, angry psalm 2, psalm 137 and 9. So this one again is happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. As I mentioned earlier, this is a song of imprecation. I'll spell it. I should have spelled it before. I-M-P-R-E-C-A-T-I-O-N. Imprecation. And it, as I said, it's a spoken curse. And the imprecatory psalms, the seven of them, are probably best summarized as being about seeing the evil in the world and praying for God's justice which can also be described as vengeance, and an end to the wicked's ability to inflict suffering on others. I would say that Psalm 58 that we just went through would be considered in that category the same. What did David really want? He wanted to prevent the wicked so that they didn't have the ability to harm people any longer. So let's read more of Psalm 137, and let's read the whole thing. Psalm 137, 1 through 9, it's one of the hymns we sing in the, in the Psalms in our songbook. I noticed that the part about dashing children was left out of the psalm. That's probably for the best. But what we have here, as one of the Jewish commentaries say, is this basically the section here of psalms is a lament for Jerusalem from the post-exilic era. In other words, it was written after they'd come out of the exile. And it's conveyed through the persona of a temple singer or a Levite now in ex exile, as if they were in exile. The main theme is remembering Zion. The psalmist is often recited on the 9th of Av. I should have double-checked with my wife. That's actually very soon. The 9th of Av is, is um, either late July or early August. 
a day that commemorates the destruction of the temple. So let's read it. Psalm 137, 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue clean in the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. And then the real pivot here. This gets these three, the other two verses with it, I think, pretty quickly help to convey an idea of maybe what's going on here. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Now, there is debate over this word here that's translated happy, and not everybody agrees with it being translated as happy. It can also be translated as blessed, which maybe doesn't seem to make it much better. Uh, another translation says, O daughter of Babylon, Soon to be devastated, how blessed will be the one who repays you for what you dished out to us. How blessed will be the one who grabs your babies and smashes them on a rock. Okay, so at the, at the very least, and, and to, for me, when I was reading and studying this, it's just not merely, again, something being vindictive. There's a sense of justice being done here. Now, this may uh, offend our delicate sensibilities, understandably, but at the very least, we see right off the bat, there's... Uh, um, uh, vengeance that's being done here. Um, from the expositor's commentary, Babylon is personified as the daughter of Babylon. The psalmist prays that Babylon and all that Babylon represents will come to an end. The blessing, or happy, lies on anyone use, used in bringing down Babylon. The idiom of blessing is used here for the purpose of imprecation, which is the curse, the curse of Babylon is an expression of the text talianus, which is the principle of retribution. God did use Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to conquer Jerusalem, but in the end time, in this, symbol, in this um, a system that it symbolizes and the terrible things that they're going to do, they will pay a price for it. Another commentary. They don't like it being translated happy at all. They say the translation happy is strictly incorrect. Mostly it means blessed, under God's blessing. Often it means happy or personally fulfilled. Sometimes in line with its basic meaning of straight, it means right, doing the right thing. The psalmist asks nothing about Babylon but notes that when Babylon is treated in the same manner as Babylon treated Jerusalem, it will be right. Now one thing I might mention is in my uh, last summer as I explored um, some of the ancient history of Persia and the Greeks and the Romans, and there's a lot of talk about the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, if you've ever seen the giant reliefs that they've uncovered depicting the Assyrian kings uh, doing various terrible things to other people, they would actually probably be happy if they were the ones asked to do this. So it is possible. But that's, I don't think, the primary sense of this. I think the better way of looking at this is, is that they noted here. Uh, the basic meaning of straight, right, doing the right thing. Or as my friend Mr. Smith said when we were talking about it, he said, forgive me for sounding like Yoda. In line with his will, they are. Speaking of those doing this job for God. And we see multiple examples throughout the Bible of God using people that you wouldn't expect and referring to them as his servant and commissioning him to do the job. For example, um, I, I don't have the time to go through this, the scriptures about this, but Pharaoh and the Exodus. There's a couple times it was talked about how Pharaoh was raised up for the purpose of God, to show his power. But the Assyrians, let's turn over to Isaiah 10 and verse 5. If you've sat in the church very long at all, you've sooner or later probably heard about us. Um, Assyria being the, the rod of God's correction. In Isaiah 10, verses 5 through 7, we see that, that very thing right here. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. So they're serving this purpose for God. I will send him against an ungodly nation, and against the people of my wrath I will give him charge. 
to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire in the street. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. So I think that's actually an excellent example of God. It's it's actually one of the more common ways that he intervenes aside from like when he would get Israel's attention through famines and droughts. But he would often use one, one country to conquer another a nation that had just gotten uh, too far afield of what God was willing to accept. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, another example. Let's go to Jer- Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. We'll read verses 8 and 9. Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against the nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. A couple chapters over in Jeremiah 27. This was uh, quite interesting to me as well. So not only will he use Nebuchadnezzar and refers to him as his servant, so he is clearly serving God in this purpose, and so that would make him in alignment with God's will, which is, I think, part of what's in play here in this difficult psalm. But those who, under this set of circumstances, who refuse to submit to him and serve him are punished even further. Jeremiah 27 and verse 8. The nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. And one final scripture that will hopefully bring the context we need to help us understand this section a little bit better is Isaiah 13 and verse 13. When we'll read through verse 19. So Isaiah 13 and 13 through 19. You know, at the time of the end, God is going to clearly have a much more direct intervention. And he will intercede in the affairs of nations in a very dramatic way. And Isaiah 13, 13 is a description of that. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. It shall be as the hunted gazelle and as a sheep that no man takes up. Every man will turn to his own people and everyone will flee to his own land. Everyone who is found will be thrust through and everyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver And as for gold, they will not delight in it. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. The eyes will not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So even that, though that psalm is fairly graphic with what's done to the small children and everything, I think probably the most important thing to take out of it in understanding that is, God putting an end to something. He's putting an end to Babylon and the Babylonian system and all those people who perpetuate that system. Uh, there's um, many examples uh, in, in the first five books of the Bible. Um, I actually did a sermon on it one time. Let, let none who breathe remain alive. When God told the children of Israel to go in and kill everybody in a town. And it was become, they, it, it's, the implication is they had become irredeemable at that point. But God's merciful. They'll be resurrected in time. But for now, what's God saying? He's going to bring down the Babylonian system, and he's going to bring an end to it, and there will not be those who who perpetuate his continuation. Okay, last angry Psalm number 3, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, angry Psalm number 3. This is a Psalm of David, and we'll read uh, verses 21 and 22 to start off with. But then we'll again expand the context. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. 
And so, you know, any, any, especially the children would reasonably ask, so I, you know, uh, I thought we were not supposed to hate people. Well, there's a little more to it than that. Who are those who hate God? Because that's what the psalmist says, O oh Lord, who hate you? Do I not hate them who hate you? So God has people that hate him. God has people like, say, the devil, who is the adversary, who stands in direct opposition to him. Those who are in a state of rebellion where they're actually fighting against and in direct opposition to God. And this has gone beyond what Mr. Herbert Armstrong said in the Mystery of the Ages, I believe, where he mentioned that most people are just passively hostile to God. But they can get stirred up and take on a much more direct opposition to God. And I look around with what's going on in the Western nations in particular these days, and it feels increasing like a direct opposition to God is at work. Another example would be the whole, you know, I talked about knowing the life of David. A big player in the life of David was um, Saul. And Saul, it's very clear when you read the, one of the, the kind of wrap-up chapters of him when near the end of Saul's life, where he goes to the witch of Endor and asks what he should do. And the demon that comes up and speaks to him says, you have made yourself the enemy of God. And how did he do that? By directly opposing David. David was ordained to be the next king after Saul. And Saul raised his hand. And in fact, he spent everything he had in the latter half of his life to prevent that from happening. And in that process, he made God his enemy by opposing David in that case. And it would make sense that it would work in reverse. So let's pick it up in verse 19. So verses 1 through, there's a real pivot in verse 19. Verses 1 through 18 of Psalm 139 talk about an all-seeing, all all present creator who knows every detail of David's life. And it's actually a very touching, kind of intimate psalm. And in verse 19, we have this pivot. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. And to me, that makes me think again of these other psalms that we just read earlier. What is it David really wants? To put an end to the evildoer and stop him, stop them from from their ability to harm other people, but they're also their opposition to God. And so that's what he's asking God to do here. Verse 20, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Expositor's commentary notes this. Overwhelmed as he was with gratitude for God's purpose in him, the psalmist sees no purpose in the existence of the wicked. They foil God's purposes by their rebellious ways. The wicked are destructive, scheming, and rebellious to the rule of God in this world. So if God has enemies, and we serve and submit to God, that would, by extension, make them our enemies. And so we should be in line with God, with those things he's in opposition to. I think when you expand it that way, that makes sense. One example I think of is being careful that we don't have, well, so, so the better example, I think, is Lot's wife turning into salt. It was Judge Sodom and Gomorrah was Judges Wicked. They fled, but what does she do? Uh, Lot's wife turned back and looked. And when you study that section and that word that's used there, it's as if she turned back with regret. It's as if she lamented what God was doing to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so I think part of the explanation here is we want to be very careful that we don't fall in that category. If God has designated something as wrong and has put his will against us, we should be in line with that. And this this word perfectly here has a sense of, um, I'm not sure where I put it in my notes, but uh, of boundaries of an extreme, as in light and dark. Like, that's how far away you should be from being sympathetic to God's enemies, at least in this case. Now, last week, Mr. Ames entreated us to read Proverbs 8, and I'm glad I did, because it helped with this section. Let's turn over to Proverbs 8 and verse 12 as we start to conclude here. Proverbs 8 and verse 12. One of the points that... Mr. Ames was making is that because here this whole Proverbs 8 is wisdom is in play. Wisdom is actually it's interesting that we're talking about these metaphors and these similes. Here wisdom is depicted as a woman calling out 
and you should answer her call. And she's been around this whole time. And one of the points Mr. Ames made was that there is wisdom in hating the things that God hates. Psalm 8 and verse 12 and 13. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. So what is hated here? Pride, arrogant, the evil way. I actually would be easy to read over the evil way. The evil way is actually a very broad thing that you could talk about. And it reminds me immediately of Cain. Cain was the way of get. It was an entire way of life. And this is what God is in opposition to. So David here is making the point that he wants to be on the same page as God with what he hates. Let's come down to Proverbs 8 and verse 32. And we'll read through verse 36. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. And so this would be naturally, if you think about it, in contrast to the evil way. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and attains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul, and all those who hate me love death. Again, who are God's enemies and therefore our enemies? The rebellious, those who rise up, the wicked, and those who hate their own soul by contrast. You know, the Psalms often add fascinating uh, subtext to other stories in the Bible. They can often add in detail that makes our overall understanding of the Bible more complete. You know, David had his enemies. I mean, that's, that's you don't read about David's life very long, and you know he had enemies, and lots of them. But he wasn't a petty and vindictive man. When he asked God to break out the teeth of his enemies, he was not asking for them to be brutally maimed, but rather he was asking God to take away their power to harm and hurt. The Psalms also show us that God's mercy endures forever. And this doesn't mean, but this doesn't mean that he won't bring justice and vengeance, and when necessary, repay the evildoer. Let's make sure that we are in line with God's wills, that his enemies are our enemies, and when we are, he will break the power of our enemies.